Hey there, and welcome to your video on topics 2.6 and 2.7 um, on adaptations and ecological succession. Um, your very first question about why are reptiles and amphibian populations declining are all very clearly listed here. You can see all of the, um, the italicized reasons. Um, this is, you know, clearly kind of a difficult multiple choice type thing, um, which you need to be aware of is, um, and this will come up, with topic 2.7 is that amphibians are an indicator species. Um, indicator species are those that are easy to find, easy to catch, easy to count, that are a um, indication on the health of an entire ecosystem. So um, why is it important to kind of know all of this stuff? Because if these things are causing amphibians and reptiles to decline, then clearly they are affecting the entire ecosystem. What this does is it makes the life of a biologist easier because you only have to track one species as opposed to the whole ecosystem. Um, but I also bring this up because again, when it comes to answering uh, free response questions on the national exam, things like habitat loss and fragmentation, um, climate change, uh, pollution, overhunting, these are all uh, standard responses to a lot of questions as to what are humans doing to um, reduce diversity in the ecosystem, or excuse me, in, in on our planet. Please be aware that it is not enough to simply say climate change. You need to say, why is climate change an issue? And there, as an example, a couple of reasons. Um, uh, warmer temperatures can trigger them to breed too early, meaning that their um, tadpoles, when they do hatch, don't have anything to eat. Um, it also is an increase in drought, which means a decrease in um, moist places where, um, you know, uh, amphibians spend a part of their uh, life cycle in, uh, in, in water. Um, so again, when, when you're looking at this, don't just, it's not enough to just simply say habitat loss and fragmentation. You've always got to follow that up with a because. So this is more of a nugget to tuck away when we're talking about indicator species and also how to answer a national exam. It's not enough to say that uh, an FRQ in the national exam. It's not enough to say this word, um, all of these. That being said, you know, it's, it's fair to uh, know what is causing uh, reptiles and especially amphibians to decline. All of these reasons here. Um, so what might a reason uh, not be? Um, I'm not sure. These frogs, poor guys, are getting affected by a lot of different things. And even things that seem natural, like viral and fungal diseases and parasites, um, there's some indication that the um, increase in incidence of these is directly related to climate change. Warmer conditions can mean that these guys do better in a broader range and so therefore affect more species. All right. Um, what is evolution and natural selection? Um, I'm really hoping that your, <coughs> excuse me, your um, biology classes kind of gave you the classic example of this. Um, the biggest thing here is to realize natural selection takes place um, in, uh, in individuals. Evolution is a population over time. So genes mutate, uh, individuals survive and reproduce, you know, provided that genetic mutation is beneficial. Uh, and also can be passed down, and then a population evolves. Uh, evolution doesn't mean uh, becoming better. It just simply means that you survive changes in your environment. Um, if your environment doesn't change, then evolution really isn't necessary. Um, alligators are a great example of that. They have not, as far as we know, evolved in a long, long time. Their uh, niche in the ecosystem has not really, really changed. Um, major source of information used to support the theory of evolution, flat out fossils. Um, we can uh, chart changes uh, through fossils. Now, do you realize the majority of things on this planet don't form fossils because they don't have hard bits that get um, uh, embedded in this rock, but we have uh, enough of them that either via impressions or the bones left behind have really helped us uh, note how evolution occurs. Uh, we do see some evolution happening in real time. Uh, those are things that uh, I will bring up in class. Um, again, is evolution linked to populations or individuals? It's a population thing. And what are the steps that lead to evolution? Um, please make sure that you, again, read here. Uh, evolution is only going to occur in uh, organisms that have uh, genetic variability. 
Um, how do they get that increased genetic variability? Remember, it's just luck, straight up mutations. So you have a mutation that can be passed along um, that is beneficial and means that um, those that have that mutation uh, are uh, able to uh, reproduce more successfully. You can see up here, uh, sometimes evolution is not good for humans in terms of, um, uh, you can see antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. Um, right, so again, understand that that trait has to be heritable and it has to be beneficial and it has to have arisen before the change in the environment. Uh, you don't evolve in response to a change. You are pre-adapted before the change exists. Don't have a pre-adaptation, you go extinct uh, as, a, as a population or a species. Um, let's see, I covered that question. Blah, 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 blah. Phylogenic tree, that's just simply a definition. Um, this simply shows how organisms are related to each other. Um, and you can see it's all right here. Uh, do you have to memorize this or even be aware of, uh, you know, the, the, how this works? No, but just realize that from a genetic perspective, everything is related to each other. And uh, the prevailing theory as to why that is the case is evolution. Otherwise, we would not have genetics in common. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, what are two limits to adaptation through natural selection? So those are all answered right here. Um, so um, right here, a change in environmental conditions leads to adaptations only for genetic trait are already present in the population pool, which I think we've kind of talked about to death. Even if a beneficial, and here's a second one, even if a beneficial heritable trait is present in the population, the population's ability to adapt may be limited by its reproductive capacity. This is really important um, uh, for you to understand why it is uh, that our selected species are more likely to survive rapid changes than case-selected species because their uh, uh, ability to fix a new um, mutation into their population can, can happen much more rapidly. Uh, you look at something like humans, even if a beneficial mutation did pop up, the likelihood that it would help us, let's say, through um, the climate changes that we're experiencing right now is pretty slim. So um, it's also why case-selected species are often endangered because they don't have the re reproductive capacity to keep up with changes that are occurring around them. That's why our selected species pretty much survive everything because their um, uh, mutations, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're, you know, able to be fertile and reproduce within six weeks of being born, you, you have more opportunities for beneficial mutations to arise, basically is how this works. Uh, now, a question I get is, why is it that we do have case-selected species? It seems to be great to have R. Case-selected species do really well in times of stability, where there is no change. Our selected species do better in times of change. So, uh, you know, yeah, we wouldn't have case-selected species if it didn't work so well uh, a lot of the time. All right, um, five common myths concerning evolution through natural selection. Um, they're all right here. Uh, we've gone over them in class. Just, again, uh, not only know them, but be able to articulate uh, why it is that they're, <laughs> excuse me, incorrect. Um, it is not enough to go, well, you know... Uh, be able to to string together an articulate reason as to why. Um, this is where doing practice on your own is super helpful because uh, a lot of you who are on that bubble of passing or not passing the national exam are going to find that your ability to clearly um, and concisely give good responses on the free response questions are going to be why it is that you pass the national exam. So pose questions to yourself, answer them on your own, see how you do. Uh, you play like your practice. If you don't practice, you can't hope to be able to play well. All right, speciation is right here. Um, one species evolves into two more different species. Um, there are two ways of doing that, either geographic isolation, which is called allopatry, um, and uh, then there's reproductive isolation, which is sympatry. Um, let's see what we have right here. Um, and I think we covered that pretty thoroughly in class as well. But again, absolutely read. Um, one is a physical barrier, and then one is a behavioral barrier uh, as to how that works. 
Now this next part is, is something that we did not cover in class. Things like artificial selection and genetically modified organisms we will hit again harder when we do our agriculture and uh, land use section, but it doesn't hurt for you to know them now. Artificial selection is basically uh, human-led evolution. Um, that is where uh, we notice a certain trait in an organism and we simply select organisms to breed so that we can go ahead and enhance that trait. Um, as an example, um, and I welcome you to Google this, <coughs> um, corn used to be a grain called teosinte, and it was only, uh, the, the cobs were only as big as your pinky. And then through artificial selection, we went ahead and uh, created the corn that you know now. And that's something we did way, way before technology. You simply can take um, uh, your, your, your best and fattest ears of corn that you have, take a little paintbrush and, and make sure that one pollinates the other, and then only save those seeds to grow again the next year. Uh, we've done this with cows. Uh, cows are not born with gigantic udders that produce milk for dozens and dozens of, of, of organisms. Normally they only create milk for their one calf. Um, you know, that dogs, another great example, cats, uh, any pet that we have basically. Um, so this is something we've done for a long time without modern technology. Um, let's see, differentiate between selective breeding and genetic engineering. Uh, selective breeding is exactly what I said before. Um, genetic breeding is where, using technology, we are able to um, uh, create combinations of DNA that are not possible, uh, quote-unquote, in the wild. In other words, to take a, a bacterial uh, genetic sequence and put it into a plant. Um, as an example, we have been able to create uh, uh, plants that can produce their own pesticides. Uh, there, there are some schools of thought that this is scary, but then uh, at the same time, if you have, if you're able to create a plant that can, that's drought to tolerant or can tolerate low levels of salinity in the water that you use to water it or can produce its own pesticide, then you are um, reducing water use, you're reducing pesticide use. There are a lot of benefits to this. Um, there is also some concern that these organisms uh, eating them would somehow adversely affect humans. Um, we've been doing this for decades and haven't seen it. Um, some of the future possibilities of, of this uh, genetic engineering is actually kind of fascinating to me. Like I've read, there is one lab that is working on taking the uh, bioluminescence from organisms like jellyfish and putting it in plants so that they glow at night when they need to be watered. Um, utterly fascinating and really, really cool stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, so again, uh, and here, here is what genetically modified organisms are. Um, uh, so, you know, definitely read about that stuff. Um, let's see, and, and, and again, uh, whether or not genetic, genetically modified organisms should be allowed to, to be used, um, that is something that we will talk about in agriculture, because, the, like, as an example, the way the United States look at, looks at them versus the way that uh, the European Union looks at them are two totally different views, um, and uh, we'll discuss. All right, let's see. What is extinction? You know, that, that you should be able to give, again, a cogent I answer to that, um, it is when an entire species ceases to exist. They're done. You, you, they're, they're, they're not any there. And again, I think we've talked about this a, a lot. If you have a, uh, a change, you either have a pre-adaptation that allows you to survive, uh, you move, or you die. Um, we've already talked about endemic species before. They're found in only one area. Um, endemic species are often endangered because, again, if changes occur to the one tiny place that you find them, they're done. Um, is extinction good, bad, or both? It, it's Extinction has no um, moral value. When something goes extinct, it gives something else the possibility of arising in its place. So it's ex uh, extinction is bad for the organism going extinct. Extinction is good for the organism that is now um, rising up in its place. Um, and, and it does that usually through adaptive radiation. If you also think about, 
Um, we've talked about uh, fundamental niches and realized niches. Basically, uh, what extinction can do is allow for an organism to go from its realized niche to its fundamental niche, and then if there is some sort of uh, partitioning that occurs in terms of allopatric species, you know, allopatric or sympatric, then you have new species arise to go ahead and and uh, fill in those places where there's no competition. Um, it's just kind, you know, the, no organism is doing this with a purpose, but all of these pressures are always at play. And in general, uh, the reason you don't have new species arise uh, without something else going extinct is that they can't outcompete the organism that's already there. And so that mutation, why, while it might be beneficial, is not beneficial enough to go ahead and overcome the population that's there. Um, obviously, it is easy to outcompete out a species that goes extinct, which is where um, the evolution of new species comes in. So please make sure that you never refer to um, evolution as being some sort of thought process. It's just the way that environmental pressures work, and then evolution is the thing that happens when you kind of remove an environmental pressure that keeps new organisms from arising. Um, so good or bad or both, no, but what makes extinction bad is that you're losing unique genetic material. And when you're talking about a food web and everything being connected, um, that, that's a problem. So the extinction of one organism can be bad for others. I mean, bees are a great example. Bees go extinct. All of the organisms that depend upon them for pollination are kind of out of luck. So um, it really just depends on how you look at it. And quite frankly, it just depends on your viewpoint. Um, the, the loss of pollinated species would be terrible for humans because a lot of our food comes from pollinated plants. Now, not all of them. When we talk about agriculture, we will talk about wind pollinated plants. So it's not necessary for everything. Then again, what does the entire planet care uh, if, if humans go extinct? It doesn't. The earth keeps turning and um, new species would arise in our place. So do you realize that um, how one feels about extinction really depends upon uh, your, your, your place in the food web, I suppose. Um, why do we think current extinction rates are rising? Good old HIPCO. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of things that humans are doing to the environment. So again, uh, this is a really good um, adapt migrate to go extinct. Really great uh, FRQ here. I do encourage you to practice on your own. Uh, if you find that you're not doing well, uh, practice. That's how you get better. All right. And then uh, how is climate change affecting polar bears? That's in the, on the previous page right here, 109. Uh, the reason I have page 110 here, although I didn't ask any questions about this, is again, just to be aware of how many previous extinctions there have been, um, uh, the, the KT event, um, and be aware that we're, we seem to be going through a sixth mass extinction because of what humans are doing. All right, so the next one is ecological succession, 99 to 101. Let me flip back here really quick. Um, indicator species, I've already discussed what those are um, in terms of amphibians. Uh, birds, butterflies, and uh, frogs are great examples of indicator species because of their sensitivity. Frogs especially, because of their permeable skin, um, they are, uh, you know, they, they, especially when it comes to pollution. Now things like birds are really good because they are migratory. Um, they can tell you about multiple different locations on the globe as to, to how it is that they're doing based on the numbers that they have. Um, okay, a, a keystone species is one whose effect on its environment is uh, much larger than what it looks like in the food web. A uh, classic example is the American alligator. Uh, gator holes are oftentimes the only uh, source of water during the, the dry season. Um, they are also uh, an apex predator, so they help to keep a lot of other populations uh, vigorous by uh, weeding out those who are less... Um, suited for their environment. Um, and we've also talked about you know, uh, pollination. We've talked about that as well. Um, two other classic examples are the, um, the beaver. Uh, beavers literally create an entire ecosystem through their dams. And then also um, uh, sea otters. Uh, sea otters eat urchins 
a lot of them. And those urchins, uh, and they live in something called a kelp forest. Um, I posted a supplemental video on uh, my website. You can watch it or not. Just be aware that if sea urchins eat um, the roots of the kelp, it kills these kelp plants that are rooted into the ground and stretch up for about 100 feet and create li literally an underwater forest that a lot of other organisms live in. And so if the sea urchins are allowed to overpopulate, they basically mow down the forest and everything that lives in the forest is gone. So um, simply by what the sea otter eats, it makes that entire ecosystem possible. Um, and of course, there was a time when uh, we had hunted them almost to extinction because of their pelts. Um, mangroves, uh, red mangroves especially, those are the ones with exposed roots. You've seen them around our um, where we live here in Collier County. Um, uh, they have a lot of, they, they act like a nursery. A lot of little guys uh, shelter in their roots. They also prevent soil erosion and, quite frankly, create new masses of land when they're out in the middle of a river because they catch the soil within their roots. Um, so just tuck at least one example in the back of your head in case they um, uh, ask for an example on the national exam. And then also be able to uh, articulate as to why it is a keystone species. Remember, this is an AP class. It's not enough to just say who. You have to say why. All right. Um, I've already talked about that. All right. Primary succession. So this is, we're kind of jumping um, entirely over 186. Sorry for the flipping. All right, so primary success succession is what happens when you go from exposed rock all the way to what's called a climax community, which is an assortment of plants that supports a complex um, uh, and highly diverse uh, range of other organisms. Please realize that this is not different plots of land. This is the same plot of land over time. So basically, here's how this works. Exposed rock. Lichens and moss come first because they come first in primary succession. Here they are called uh, a pioneer species. In the act of growing, they break down this rock to create soil, and then when they die, they also um, then uh, 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 create a nutrition in the soil. Now, please realize this whole time, all of these other plants, uh, you know, seeds and spores are landing on this stuff, but they just flat out can't grow. So it's not like these guys go, oh, it's time, and then they move in. They've been trying to get in here the whole time, and it after this breaks down soil for a while, basically the act of these things living, they create their own demise. And now these guys are out, able to outcompete these guys. They do the same thing. They break down the soil. They, they add more air pockets, which roots need in order to do their thing. Um, and when they die, they make the soil even more nutritious. And then these guys can finally establish themselves so now compete that, and so on and so on and so on. So... It's exposed rock, lichen and moss, um, uh, grass and herbs, little shrubs. Um, then you start getting the, the smaller trees, and then you start getting the, the larger, um, longer living trees. So uh, primary succession. Uh, primary succession in a lake is basically when sediment builds up to the point that the lake fills up. Um, and again... Uh, then you end up having uh, a, t a terrestrial ecosystem as opposed to a lake ecosystem. Um, now, another kind of succession is secondary succession. The only difference is that secondary succession is when you have bare earth. So that would be a classic example as a forest fire comes and burns all the trees down. But you don't have rock, you have earth. Which means that now your pioneer species are these guys. And clearly this is going to take less time than this. Um, so, but we're talking a couple of hundreds of years before you get that climax community. Um, let's see, why is succession important? Well, it, it, it's, it enriches biodiversity. Remember, the more biodiversity you have, the more likely you are to uh, survive change. Um, and also it means that if you have a complex food web and one of your organisms goes extinct, not a big deal because there's a bunch of other stuff. All right, um, let's see, three factors, um, how and what rate uh, ec ecological succession occurs. Again, facilitation, um, I talked about that with primary succession. Inhibition, um, is there anything that is keeping uh, organisms from growing? Um, 
This is something I'm going to bring up when we talk about forests. Uh, pine trees create their own uh, herbicide um, in that their uh, needles make the soil too acidic. If you look at pine trees here in southwest Florida, you'll notice nothing grows underneath them, and this is exactly why. Um, so it means they have nothing to compete with. Uh, again, is that something they thought about? No, that's just a um, uh, beneficial mutation that arose that allowed them to be successful. And then tolerance is the third. Uh, I talked about a climax community already. Resistance and resilience. So um, there's the climax community. You may want to re revisit this again. All right. Um, resistance. Hmm, hold on a second. I'm looking at this. Uh, secondary succession in aquatic ecosystems. I'm not sure that there is secondary succession in aquatic ecosystems. So we'll ignore that one. I'll address that in class. <clears throat> All right. Um, resistance means can you avoid uh, something, uh, uh, some sort of um, disturbance? Uh, bothering your your ecosystem at all, and then resilience is can you, can you bounce back? So, and again, evidence suggests that some ecosystems have one of these properties but not the other. So, um, rainforests are very resistant because um, they've got a lot of biodiversity there. But once you cut down a rainforest, it, it doesn't bounce back. It just doesn't because, again, the um, as we've discussed before the um, uh, there is no nutrition in the soil it's largely in the the plants so once all those plants are gone that there, there's nothing for them to come back um, grasslands a fire sweeps through them regularly and burns them right down to a nubbin most of the living part of the grass the reproductive part is underneath they're called rhizomes and the root system still stays in place so as soon as the fire is done um, remember the fire is actually beneficial for them uh, they they can use the now more available nutrition in the ashes of, of their their um, of their leaves to go ahead and sprout up again. So they are more resilient. They're built to actually need that disturbance. Um, so that pretty much covers all of those things that are in there. Uh, if for some reason our lecture got cut short in terms of uh, definitions like adaptive radiation. Um, those are pretty much on the slides that are posted on, um, on my website. So that's it.